Broadly speaking, electronic group sets have tended to be considered more performant, faster, and generally more reliable in terms of shift performance than their mechanical counterparts. Now, if this wasn't true, we would probably be seeing a little more pushback at the pro level. Now, I can say that because in the power meter realm over the last, I don't know, seven or eight years, what we've sometimes seen is if a company releases a bad power meter and they're a sponsor and thus the pros are riding it well, sometimes you see them using alternative power meters such as pedals or other crank sets during training rides. But this hasn't been the case for electronic group sets as a whole. There's very little pushback that I've heard of, and only sometimes do you see a rider who will say that they actually prefer the mechanical, and then they still tend to ride the electronic because of sponsors. This is usually because they are considered faster and more accurate. Or are they? Well, the short answer is yes, but kind of no, but that's to get to the yes. If you're new to the video series, just a quick little recap. I've been working on my own uh, replacement power unit. In fact, a wireless replacement power unit with interchangeable batteries. And the reason I've been doing that is the Campagnolo power unit has had low availability, especially for the 11 speed and an exceedingly high cost because you're not only throwing out the battery that is now dead, but you're actually throwing out the same electronics that you are about to buy, as well as connectors that are all proprietary and very expensive. Right now, I have the code and the electronics working to a, a decent state. It needs a few more features before it gets put on the bike, but one of the things that it is missing is key to the electronic group set's performance, the overshift. That little overshift is one of the many advantages an electronic group set has over its mechanical counterparts. Now, sure, a experienced professional might be able to do the same thing with a mechanical in one direction, but maybe not in the other. But that little cheat, that little overshift, gives it quite an advantage because it can apply a little more force. It can make sure that chain really is pulled into position and then just quickly move back. If you've ridden a bike with a front derailleur for any length of time, you'll probably realize that the hard stop for when you upshift is actually a little bit further out than where the front derailleur will sit when you're in the big ring. And so you've got this little extra movement and that's so that when you actually shift up, you can actually overshift. And that really helps, especially with older tech chain rings and, and lower quality gear to make sure that shift happens. Now, the disadvantage is that if that hard stop is poorly tuned, well, either still get a bad shift because it's too close, or you're going to overshift and drop the chain. An electronic group set, on the other hand, has a sensor to know this exact position at all times, and it's constantly checking it. So as it overshifts, it can be pre-programmed not to go to a position where it risks falling and then it will just move back to avoid noise or rubbing or so lost watts. In short, it exists so that it can shift as fast as possible to that overshift position, making sure the shift occurs, not dropping the chain and then moving back before you hear any rubbing that makes you think it's misaligned or robs you of precious watts. So the wireless power unit is really supposed to be a whole no compromise situation. Starting from the lithium high voltage with much higher current levels, a motor controller that is a significant reduction, almost an order of magnitude lower of inline resistance when driving that motor. We've shortened the wires. All of these things lead to greater performance. And it might seem silly, but in previous videos, which you should check out, I used high speed uh, footage as well as measuring the current on an oscilloscope to see how long it actually takes to complete a shift. And well, these lithium high voltage packs made a significant difference. Combine that with all the other things, well, you should look at this as we're not out operating outside of the EPS limits so much as we are removing 
the limits that were inherent in the system to begin with. So the first thing I need to do is I need to build a method of intercepting these signals from the power unit to the derailleur so that we can measure its angle for overshift. That way I can take that data and put it into my code from my wireless uh, power unit. And in fact, I've actually already built one of these interceptors for that high speed video and current measuring. Uh, I just really chopped it up again and rewired it now with wires for the hall sensors, which have a power, a ground, and there are two outputs, uh, sine and cosine. So basically 90 degrees to each other. So before I can plug this into anything like the microcontroller I'm using for my project and uh, taking analog samples, well, I need to figure out how the current power unit shifts or how it duty cycles or powers those Hall effect sensors. I know it has to turn them on, but is it doing it like I'm doing it and turning it on for a very short period, taking several samples, turning it off, and then waiting and then turning it back on, take some samples, turn it off. This is a common way of duty cycling and it is very power efficient. But when I actually plug the oscilloscope into this, what I saw was something simpler. Basically, the Hall effect sensors are turned on whenever they're doing a shift for the entire duration of the shift. And that meant I can trigger off their power and then sample only when the power is high and then stop sampling when it goes low. This means my existing code, the code that duty cycles, well, I don't have it powering the Hall effect sensors, but I just have it sampling the same way. And actually I turned up the data rate to 512 Hertz so that I have a little extra accuracy, but it made it really simple. So now all I have to do is gather some data. So we have all this data, but maybe before we get to overshift, why don't we just look at some of the performance specs as they stand. So how accurate is this derailleur? Well, after running a few tests, on average, its standard deviation is about 10, maybe 11 degrees. Now keep in mind, that's 10 or 11 degrees on the output of the gearbox into a linear screw jack that runs on the diagonal of the parallelogram to move it in and out. So when I say 10 degrees, you have to keep in mind that it takes anywhere from 700, maybe 600 to 900 degrees of rotation in order to shift one gear. Now let's round out some of those numbers, 900 degrees, um, and we have 10 degrees here, so 1 90th, we'll call it 1 100th, and we are moving say six millimeters, well, that means our positional error is 0 0.06 millimeters. That's pretty good. And my code is actually kind of doing better than that. I'm actually looking at uh, much smaller errors I'm seeing when I go to the shift targets. Now, my wake up is still five or 10 degrees, which seems I, I was about right on, but it does bode really well for angular accuracy or positional accuracy for using this for 12 speech, which we know Campanile already did. They reused the same motor in the EPS 12 derailleurs, but you might be able to eke out 13 or 14 gears potentially if you could somehow get it to fit the pancake of a cassette you would have. But that bodes really well that I can probably back off a few of the little kind of control stuff that I've done with my derailleur. Due to the clever way I'm reading where I'm only actually sampling when it's actually running the Hall effect sensors, I'm not actually capturing the time in between these events, but I am keeping a count of every time the Hall effect is powered up or powered down. And so I can delineate exactly from when it's shifting or overshifting and when it's shifting back. But it's actually still really obvious when you actually look at the chart. In most cases, if there is an overshift, you will see that it will go to a position and then you will see it move back. Sometimes there are no overshifts and it will move straight to the position and then there's nothing. 
And in some cases, there is some PID overshoot. Now, this is just likely because uh, I'm not running this with a, a chain or on a bike. It's just sitting on my tabletop on one of the motors I have. And well, it's probably expecting there to be some mass or back force. So it's now overtuned and it's, it's overshooting a little bit. So I'm going to ignore those and those aren't being counted as an overshift because we, we're not really seeing something programmatically. Because of the, the way I'm capturing, I'm not capturing the, the dead time between. I already measured that manually on the oscilloscope. It's about 700 milliseconds. So yeah, that's fine. We can implement that later. I, I don't need to capture that and, and check that every single time. I just went through all the gears and checked it and they're all basically 700 milliseconds. When we're shifting up the cassette, so when we're up shifting, going to an easier gear, going to a bigger gear, what we see is the first five-ish gears, or five gear shifts, well, they are all around 300 degrees of overshift. Except for the very first one, which is a bit wider range, but about 270. And I guess once you get to a big enough gear, the geometry and the reliefs that are cut into it and the tooth profiles, there's enough of that to mean that you don't actually need an overshift to get your quality shift performance. So very easy to implement on my side, just a little over shift of 270 for that first, 300 for the next few, and then 700 millisecond wait to bring it all back. Downshifting, as in going from the bigger to the smaller gear, going down, well, that one's a little more complicated. What we're seeing is that there is always an overshift, but they're all kind of very variable. The first few are very small. They're almost not perceivable, but they are there. We can actually see that they go back. Then around, I think, uh, the eighth gear, when it shifts to it, it it is a much larger, it's not huge, but it is bigger. And then it, the next one is smaller, and then we get bigger again. And so when we're at the small teeth, we expected them to be large, but they keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger until the very final getting down from that, you know, 12th to 11th tooth, or in some cases, the 13th to a 12th tooth. That one is a little bit smaller. I'm going to speculate a little bit here and I think there's a couple of options for some of the weird shapes in, in this profile. I think one of the options is that, well, you can kind of draw a line that says, oh, well, no, these, these should all have progressively bigger and bigger overshifts. But maybe because of some geometry on the various different cassettes that they're able to optimize it and, well, you need a little bit of overshift initially, but then geometry lines up better and well, you get rid of the overshift. You don't use it if you don't need it. And then once you get back into needing it, yeah, ramp it up to just what you need. So follow that, that trend. Alternatively, we can think about this as, well, maybe it should just be a mirror of the upshift where there's this consistent overshift, but there's maybe a geometric reason, like we, we are overshifting on those original big ones going down, but not very much, barely perceivable uh, until we get some bad geometry. Maybe one of the cassettes, because the EPS system doesn't really have a knowledge of what cassette is, is on the, the system. Maybe there's one or two that has some difficulties there. So they, they add a little overshift just to try and improve it. And then when it gets down to the lower ones where you expect the overshift, it ramps up just to what is needed, except for the last one, which they compromise on a little bit so it doesn't overshift and cause the chain to come off and get jammed. So that's, that's all a little speculation, but I, I think it's rooted in some, some decent understanding there. So that's it. Basically electronic group sets they overshift, they shift to the wrong position in order to get the shift performance, and then they shift back to the right position in order to give you, you know, noise and don't rob, you know, that fraction of a watt. 
and you know maybe maybe a professional uh, probably with ultra shift based shifters could overshift in both directions to meet the same performance and and as fast but i don't think you could do it consistently or reliably without dropping a chain or causing a jam you know these are these are the reasons why we're seeing this uptick in electronic uh, group sets i believe that they give you pro level performance without ever having to think about it now for me i learned a great deal about this i've now got enough data to go and implement this on my own system and hopefully you learned something too at least about derailers and exactly how the overshift is happening one of the things that this does leave things open for for me is I don't actually know how different this is going to be on a 12 speed. So with that, I hope you learned something and thanks for watching.